real pleasure tonight to be able to um, have Jared Burks here. Jared got his PhD from Ohio State University, um, and he has been working in the field in Ohio since that time. But one of the unique features that Jared brings to this is he has been a pioneer in the use of ground penetrating radar and has made converts of many archaeologists in terms of the fact that we can learn a huge amount about the archaeology sites without having to dig and without having to do damage to them, that he can look at them with the ground penetrating radar and other sources as well. Um, and I, I hope I'm not saying anything out of turn, but he just got his license for drones, and so that's the next level for us. So let me introduce Dr. Jared Burke. It's interesting that we got our license after I crashed it the first time. <laughs> it still flies, sort of. Um, so uh, I, I got my PhD at Ohio State. Don't hold that against me. Uh, it was back in 2004. And while I was in graduate school, um, I had a job in Chillicothe at a national park there. Maybe you've been there. Hopeful Culture National Historical Park. And my, my dissertation work was mostly on this group called the Hopewell and their settlement practices. So I was aiming for everyday life. You know, what do they eat? Where do they live? Kind of the, you'd think the boring stuff, but it's, it's like the sum total of prehistory in Ohio, that, that kind of stuff. But working for the National Park, uh, I couldn't help but fall in love with Ohio's earthworks because that <coughs> park has five really big Hopewell earthworks sites. Now, earthworks may not be a thing you're too terribly familiar with here in the Lower Hocking Valley. There just aren't that many of them here. That said, if you go up the road to the plains, um, you're probably familiar with a number of smaller ones there. And Ohio is just covered in that stuff. Uh, and because of my interest in geophysics, um, I'm trained as a dirt archaeologist, and I sort of picked up geophysics along the way. So if there are any physicists in the crowd, you know, bite your tongue. Uh, I'm not a physicist, so I'm going to talk about this stuff from an archaeologist's perspective. Mostly just going to show you cool, cool images of the results at a number of earthwork sites. So Ohio is covered in lots of earthworks. You guys know these um, being from this area. This is what you have in the plains, these sorts of shapes. Small circular enclosures. Um, you also have some enclosures that are squares with rounded corners, although you may not know. Um, they're a little tricky to see. Uh, we have these giant ones here that um, are real common in Ross County, uh, where I work for the National Park. This guy here is about a thousand feet across, so very large, um, complex shapes. Um, there are five of these tripartite earthworks, um, little circle, big circle, and a square. Um, you'll notice that the maps of these have this dark line with sort of a lighter colored line around them. The dark line is a ditch, and the lighter colored line is an embankment. This one doesn't have that, it's just embankments. That'll be important here in a minute when we talk about the geophysics stuff. Then we have these really weird ones that sort of defy geometry. These are what we call hilltop forts or hilltop enclosures. They're not really forts in the sense of being protective. Um, uh, folks didn't go in there and lock the gates and keep people out. Um, the, the term fort is just sort of a historical accident. Uh, a lot of Ohio's earthworks have that term. And in fact, there was a time when all of these were referred to as forts because people couldn't understand you know, why would anybody go to the trouble and dig a ditch and throw up an embankment if they weren't trying to keep somebody out. You know, maybe they were trying to keep stuff in, perhaps. And in fact, a lot of these on the inside of them, although you don't see it on any of these maps, we'll see some of them have mounds inside of them and underneath those mounds are burials. So here's Ohio, and uh, there are something like 600 earthwork sites in Ohio. Um, these slides, unfortunately, are pretty small, especially for you all way in the back. Um, but maybe you get a sense of this band of little dots running across the state there. Um, we're, uh, where are we? We're way down here, aren't we? And that little clump there is the plain. There are not many in this region. And it's not that there aren't any here. Um, I'd say there probably are <coughs> more here that haven't been documented. Um, we keep finding them in the major river valleys over in central Ohio. And since I've been fiddling with earthworks, there's been at least, there's been at least one site found by the Hocking College campus, actually. 
uh, a circular enclosure that was never documented. Somebody knew it was there, I'm sure, but it never made it on the state list. And so uh, the folks up in Columbus had no idea it was there. Um, these are the areas where most of the earthworks are. The great big earthwork complexes like Newark is the granddaddy of them all. Uh, miles and miles of earthen embankments and some of the best preserved earthworks. If you've never been to an earthwork site, go there mm -hmm. um, and see the great circle. I think we'll see a picture over here in a second. Um, in addition to these 600 sites with earthen enclosures like circles and squares, there are 10,000 or more mounds in Ohio. From mounds that are barely perceptible, you know, a couple inches tall to um, 67 feet tall, the oh. tallest one in the state. It's over by, uh, by Dayton, Miami's earth mound. Uh, and a really interesting fact is all of this earthwork construction Mounds and enclosures happened in 700 years, more or less, um, right around about 2,000 years ago, by these groups you probably have heard of, the Adena and the Hopal. Um, and they didn't have corn agriculture, and they didn't live in villages or cities. They were dispersed across the landscape. So somehow they found enough time to cart around all this dirt. Uh, this is sort of what, um, this is the great circle there in Newark. If you were standing on the embankment wall looking kind of west, and there's a person there for scale. Um, so there are embankments, and often on the inside there's a ditch. It's pretty hard to see on this image scale-wise, but that ditch there is about eight or nine feet deep, so it's, it's deep, almost like this ceiling is tall. The embankment is about that tall. But this is a, a huge thing. This one's about 1,200 feet across, uh, pretty big. And then on the inside there is an area that the, uh, the ditch encloses, and in the middle of this one there's a mound. This is Ohio's biggest single enclosure that I'm aware of, geometric. It's 1,300 feet across, and it's in, it's in Ross County, just north of Chillicothe. It's probably one of the most invisible earthworks, too. It is flat as a pancake right there. You drive over it, and you don't even know it. Uh, there are Ohio's smallest enclosures. They're not much bigger than this room, really. Just about 60 feet across. There are tons of these, and I'll bet that there are two or three times as many that have never been documented, you know, that we don't know about yet. Here's a famous place that maybe some of you have been to. Anybody here been to Stonehenge? Mm -hmm. All right, good. It's always a few in the crowd. Uh, that's the most famous part there. <coughs> big, big rocks hauled from, I don't know how many miles, like 70 miles or something. Uh, but when you scale Stonehenge down, it really helps make Ohio's earthquakes look <laughs> big. <laughs> that's how big the you know, the famous part of Stonehenge is, it's now Stonehenge exists on a massive landscape full of, of ritual sort of uh, ceremonial constructions, but the famous part is Teeny Ween. There's another famous place. Anybody been here? Mm -hmm. Coliseum? Well, just as many. I've never been here. Uh, I'd love to go. Who doesn't want to go to Italy? Right? Uh, that puppy would fit inside Shriver Circle several times over. Um, I'm sure you've been here, right? <laughs> <laughs> the shoe. Uh, our, our Coliseum, where the glad gladiators fight every Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> Go Buckeyes. Uh, it too would fit in there with the Coliseum and Stonehenge. So earthworks, though not tall, are great big things built by folks who didn't have the wheel and who didn't have beasts of burden. As far as we know, they didn't have um, trebuchets or things like that. <laughs> yeah. They still had spears. They didn't even have the bow and arrow yet. Uh, Inside these earthwork sites are, are these mounds we were talking about before. And uh, you probably have heard the phrase burial mound before. And when we're talking about the Hopewell and most of Ohio's earthworks, it's a bit of a misnomer. The mound itself doesn't contain the burials um, that date to this time period. The mound is a monument to a place. It covers the footprint of a building. And you can see, maybe you can see those little dots there, that square with rounded corners. Um, those little dots are the post holes where the posts of the building walls went into the ground. And it's inside those buildings on the floors and under the floors where the graves are. Um, so the mound is a monument to a spot. The building is where all of that mortuary stuff happened that, that is kind of famous for the Hopewell. Uh, we don't know exactly what they did in these buildings. Um, some of them have these burned clay basins inside of which we assume people were cremated because we have piles of their <coughs> cremated remains you know, on the floors and in small graves under the floors. So cremation happened in there. Um, 
in some of these buildings have been found piles of broken up and burned um, smoking pipes. So they were probably smoking stuff inside those buildings. We know some of that stuff was tobacco. We found their teeny weeny little seeds. Uh, and, and these things played a role in some of these ceremonies and, uh, that happened inside of these buildings. The, uh, the Ohio Hopewell are known for not only earthworks, but some really amazing objects that are just iconic in, in North American prehistory. That mica hand, I think, has appeared on a zillion different book covers over the years. Um, not so well known are, are the copper bird, bird imagery there from Mount City in, in Chillicothe. Uh, but it's made from copper that comes from like Lake Superior. It doesn't come from around here. Somehow that stuff got down here, was pounded cold into these flat sheets and then cut into different shapes. Um, and then of course we have lots of platform pipes, some in the shapes of birds. What's not shown here is all the obsidian and the, the uh, whelk shells from the Gulf of Mexico and even barracuda jaws and shark's teeth that were all brought to Ohio and then deposited in, in these buildings and covered over with the mounds. So lots of, lots of busy work these Hopewell folk were doing 2,000 years ago. Now, uh, I've spent a heck of a lot of time recently looking for earthworks, uh, but the other side of the coin I, I work on every summer is some kind of archaeology field school where we're looking for Hopewell settlement. And we've been able to do that to good effect in Ross County and in Pickaway County over the last few years, and we've actually found a house down there um, that, it's outlined there. You may not be able to see it, but that yellow line there shows you about where it is. It's square. It's uh, about as wide as this room is, like 40 plus feet wide and uh, 40 across. Very big. It had four hearths in it. And um, we think it may have looked something like that um, when it was standing. It has a really big center post uh, and some, some large posts at the uh, midpoints on the walls here we came for kind of holding up this big roof here, great big roof. Uh, probably would have been covered in bark. Uh, you'd think it'd be a, a bear to heat because there's all that air there up above your head. Uh, but this is probably uh, what they managed to eke out the winter inside of uh, with, I assume, the kids going and finding a bunch of wood to burn and keep it warm. Um, I, I asked an artist friend of mine to do a drawing of what we thought maybe this house looked like. Uh, he's an art teacher in high school. Of course, he had to make a scale drawing of it, like he's an art teacher. And then he had to make it so you could remove part of the roof and look inside there. And he had all of the, the uh, roof rafters lashed together. And he took pictures of them, of course. Uh, art geek to the extreme. He wanted to know, how the heck did you get all those roof rafters attached to one center pole. He didn't think it was possible and he discovered, oh, it is. You just have to have a couple of forks uh, in the tree to cut down for that center pole. So uh, around these houses and in gardens, um, not really in, in big agricultural fields, but maybe in, in good sized garden plots, they're growing stuff like goosefoot, which is something you try to eradicate out of your yard these days. It grows in, in every sidewalk crack, I think, in Ohio. It makes these wee little seeds here. They're just a millimeter across. It, it makes a fair number of them. Um, but if you have enough of these plants, you can, you can get quite a few seeds out of it. And today, people eat this stuff all the time. It's called quinoa. Uh, and it's sort of all the rage these days. Um, if done properly, it tastes pretty good. Um, they also grew maygrass, um, which kind of is like wheat, but not quite. Um, sunflower, of course. And uh, there's what a tobacco seed looks like, a very strange um, little seed there. It's, it's half the size of the Chianpodium seed you just see. It's really small. So it's pretty tricky to, uh, as an archaeologist, to find those things. You can't even see them, they're so small. So we have to collect bags of dirt and then put that through a machine where the dirt floats to the surface and scoop that off with a scoop. Look at it under a microscope. So this is my office. <laughs> When I'm out looking for earthworks, this is what most of Ohio's earthworks that are in parks look like. They're flat. Um, they're often covered in corn or beans. Um, this was a corn year, unfortunately. Makes it hard to do my job. Um, this surveying stuff um, involves me walking lots of miles back and forth across these fields. So what I like to do before I get out there and start walking is know where the earthwork site is. So I'm walking in the right spot. And I do that um, 
with a couple of different tools. I, there are a number of books on Ohio earthworks that are pretty neat to have if you're interested in Ohio earthworks. Squire and Davis's book here from 1848 is like the Bible of Ohio earthworks. There are 88 sites listed in there. Um, so that's a good way place to start. Unfortunately, some of them have been lost since they were shown in this book, so we don't even know exactly where they are anymore. <coughs> um, there are other publications by the Smithsonian. Um, there are independently published books by non-archaeology type guys. There really wasn't an archaeology discipline in the mid-1800s yet, so all kinds of people would weigh in on these things, especially doctors. They seem to have a lot of free time. <laughs> I don't know where they got a lot of free time. There are unpublished manuscripts uh, in strange places, like this one is in the American Antiquarian Society. It actually has lots of maps of earthworks from about Logan on up to uh, Newark, the upper Hocking drainage. Um, they're never published, and some of them are very strange looking, like this one. It's on a hilltop in Perry County. Not many people know that one's there. Uh, we also have a great archive of aerial photographs for this state. And there's a fellow named Dash Reeves that flew around in the 1930s out of Wright Pat Air Force Base. He had the earthwork fever like I do uh, and took lots of great photos. So this is Newark's uh, octagon and circle with the golf course on it. There's a little earthwork there in Ross County, if you can see that one. Um, this is one that's part of that national park in Chillicothe, a big circle and square. Again, those are a thousand feet across. So you really can't appreciate them except from that far away. You know, you can get up there in an airplane and see these. Um, Dash found, um, he only found one earthwork that wasn't previously known, but he took pictures of some that had thought that people had thought were lost um, since Squire Davis's time. Every book you pick up, starting from Caleb Atwater's book in 1820, um, they say that the earthworks are nearly obliterated, uh, and we need to do something about it. And Atwater would say, "You need to buy my book <laughs> because this is the last chance you're going to get to see a nice map of it." And uh, Every book after that was sort of uh, people trying to you know, get one leg up on the last guy and make a better book. So Squire and Davis's book is sort of the answer to Caleb Atwater's book. And they have all these great maps of, of earthworks. And after Squire and Davis time for the next 50 <coughs> years, people are bemoaning how bad Squire and Davis's <coughs> maps are. And they're trying to make better maps. And then Dash Reeves comes along and takes aerial photos. This is the first time that we all can actually see the earthwork. We're not looking at a map, which is an interpretation of what somebody saw. We're seeing the real deal. So Reeves captured, uh, he probably took three or 400 photographs. And, um, and they're all uh, in the Smithsonian, actually, in the National Anthropological Archive. <coughs> um, he took some nice oblique shots, too. Um, there's another kind of data available in Ohio called LIDAR data. Uh, and it's, a, it's sort of a newfangled thing. It's the greatest invention ever for armchair archaeologists. <laughs> Hook up to the internet, download the data, make your map, and you can basically go tour the Ohio countryside. Um, and to do that, you have to have some special software because when the plane flies over and shoots those laser beams at the ground, they bounce off of everything, even birds that are flying under the plane, they'll bounce off that too. Power lines, trees, cars, top of your head, everything will cause a reflection. So this is probably Ohio's most famous earthwork site. Uh, it's been a park since the 1890s, and you can't even see it in aerial photographs because it's nice mowed grass. But in the LiDAR data, it's really easy to see. Check it out. So, of course, you know, once I discovered this stuff was available, uh, I went on a tour of Ohio um, using LiDAR data. And there's the newer uh, octagon and circle. And we've, we've removed all of the houses and stuff that surround this thing. You can still see bits and pieces of the golf course in there now. Um, here's, a, here's a really nicely preserved earthwork. Nobody knows about it by Springfield. Um, it's always been in trees in every aerial photo I've ever seen of it. Um, this is on Google Earth. Um, and if you scroll back to the different years in Google Earth, you can see it, it just never shows up. But in the LiDAR data, you know, it looks awesome. Somebody's backyard. You know, it's a pasture these days. You can also like stretch the data vertically and make places in Ohio look like the Grand Canyon, uh, which has the effect of, of highlighting the earthworks. So there's a little guy there that really stands out well once you ramp up the uh, 
the vertical scale, and then put the, the sun or the fake sun at a low angle and get some nice shadows in there. So I do all that stuff when I can before I go out in the field to do my thing. And my thing is this geophysical survey stuff. Um, because of what I do at work, I have access to these instruments that allow us to look into the ground without digging. And there are three kinds that archaeologists usually use. Uh, there's this thing called a magnetometer, um, which detects magnetism. Uh, and the, um, the topsoil in Ohio is a little more magnetic than the clay subsoil. So if you dig a hole in the ground and dump a bunch of topsoil in there and level it off, that spot's going to be more magnetic. Uh, if you burn the ground, that increases the magnetism. So this machine is good at finding holes dug in the ground, filled with topsoil, and burn stuff, which is great because the Hopewell were pyromaniacs. They did a lot of stuff with fire. Uh, and so uh, that makes it easy to find some of their sites. The electrical resistance meter up there um, allows you to stick electrodes in the ground and put current uh, in the ground. And it's really a way overpriced, um, sorry Lou, <laughs> moisture meter, just in case that's seen by the manufacturer guys. <laughs> it's awesome tool, uh, but um, it's kind of slow, so you have to poke it in the ground every time you want to take a reading. I can do about an acre a day, but it's real low data density. Great for earthworks, um, but really uh, challenging to use to find small things like cooking pits and um, house foundations. So, uh, we use it a lot of earthwork sites. And then finally, uh, ground penetrating radar there is kind of the one everybody knows about. You see it on TV a fair amount, especially the the shows on uh, forensic shows like CSI, and NCIS, I've seen it on both of those. Uh, and this is the thing everybody says, hey, can you come do a ground penetrating, a, a radar survey in our cemetery? We want you to do a radar survey. And when I hear that, what I hear is I want you to do a geophysical survey because radar has become synonymous with geophysics. When in fact, you need to use more than one instrument often on these sites uh, because the radar is not always the best one use to look for graves. It shoots uh, radio waves in the ground, as you probably know, and listens for the echoes of these things. It is the most awesome tool for finding buried house foundations, like from houses from the 1800s, and that's what we have in Ohio. Uh, and uh, it's, it's more fun than I can almost stand. You can go out and survey a, a nice uh, house with like a stone foundation, and you look at the data, it'll make a It'll collect a three-dimensional cube of data that you can slice, you know, kind of like dig down into it on your computer one level at a time and out pop cool things like house foundations. I was just in uh, Wisconsin uh, last week uh, at Beloit College. And Beloit College is known for its effigy mounds. So I was really geeked up to survey effigy mounds. And they are nearly invisible to the instruments. But we found a stone foundation of the college's observatory from the late 1800s, which I thought was really cool because it had that nice curved shape. You think of an observatory with a dome on it and all that. Um, I had fun. So this is how it works. Um, be prepared for excitement. That's it. You turn the instrument on. You know, you get it all zeroed out and such. And then it's basically an entire day of mowing your yard walking back and forth and back and forth while the machine automatically logs the readings. All you have to do is make sure you're in the right place at the right time. That's like the key to life, isn't it? If you're in the right place at the right time. Um, so the machine doesn't know where it's at, really. It, it knows how many readings you want to collect per meter, and you just have to walk at the right pace so that it gets the right amount of readings per meter. Uh, and then it gives you that. You know, zillions and zillions of numbers, which... Um, often aren't appealing to people. So the, the, uh, the machines come with software that turn the numbers into colors, which is a lot easier for our brains to interpret. Um, we now have machines that can, that can run four magnetometers at once, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's four times as fast. It's not quite four times as heavy, because it's on wheels, but I do definitely feel like a horse when I push it. Yeah. Uh, there are even bigger machines, too, that someday, hopefully, I'll be showing you a picture of my bigger machine. Um, I have 16 probes on it. You pull it with an ATV, and you better bet I'm going to have, like, a DVD player in there, and watching movies, listening to tunes, and driving around all the while. My goal is to survey all 600 Earthquake sites. Uh, I've got 
gotten to about 35 of them. So I have a ways to go yet. I need a bigger machine. But let's look at some data here. I, did anybody come to a talk given by Brett Ruby um, last year on Hopewell Archaeology? A few of you? Uh, Brett works at Hopewell Culture National Historical Park. He's the archaeologist there. Um, and in fact, he's the one that hired me on when I was a youngin. Uh, then he left, and I came back and did more archaeology there. Uh, and then he came back. He just couldn't stay away. Uh, and a few years ago, I did a project for them that involved surveying some big areas at some of their earthwork sites. So this is one that he's been working on a lot lately, Hopewell Mound Group. It's a big ditch and embankment um, that's miles long here, this ditch and embankment. It's a nice square there, about 1,000 feet across. Um, with one of Ohio's, well, this is the biggest Hopewell mound in the known universe. Um, mound 25 there. Almost all of the crazy cool Hopewell artifacts that we know about come from that mound. The copper ear spools, and like 300 pounds, well, 290 pounds of obsidian artifacts. Um, underneath that thing, uh, just like other Hopewell mounds, was a big building foundation. Uh, and inside that thing were all of these graves uh, with amazing stuff. If you were to plop that mound down inside of our hallmark here, our landmark, the shoe, uh, it would cover the whole football field. It's so big. 500 feet long and 200 feet wide and about 30 feet tall. It's a very big pile of dirt. Actually, three piles of dirt side by side. Um, so that's Hopewell Mound Group. Um, it is the namesake of the Hopewell culture, so a pretty famous spot. Um, what we were interested in finding in 2012 uh, was uh, the square there, which has become invisible from plowing over the years, uh, and that decent sized circle there. Brett calls it the Great Circle. It's not as big as the biggest Hopewell circles, but it's, it's the Great Circle at Hopewell Mound Group. It's, I think, something like 400 feet across. It's pretty big. Uh, and it's, been, it's become invisible, too, from plowing. And there was a map in the 1890s that had the word obliterated you know, written across it. So as of the 1890s, it was lost. Um, here is the LIDAR data from there, and you know, just to show you can't see it. There's that big mound there. It's truly large, huge. You, you'd think it's just a hump you know, on the landscape. I mean, you'd never think of it as a mound today. It's so big. Um, here's an aerial photo from the 1950s, one of the better ones. You can see the square there, I think. That white line there. That's the uh, outer embankment. Um, it's hard to see the circle from back here, but it's there. So that was the map we had to go on. That's the area I surveyed. And uh, let's look at the results. Um, there they are. Uh, they're really small, especially when you're sitting back there. So what I want to do is zoom in on some of these. Um, and I'll note that what we detected here, you can maybe see that, is that weird D-shaped enclosure there. We detected the ditch. The ditch has been plowed flat, and it's become filled in with topsoil. So if you remember, that topsoil is a little more magnetic. Shows up nicely uh, to the magnetometer. A little mound there. Our little circle, we've got the big circle there, showed up. The uh, Another mound, the, the outer enclosure showed up real nice. Um, this is an old stream channel. And we got bits of the square, and if you can see it, that little strange thing there is a lightning strike. I'm gonna zoom in on one of those here and see it a little closer in a minute. Let's look at this thing here. This is a little square that we found in 2001. <coughs> Accidentally, we had an Ohio State Drill <coughs> School out there, uh, and we randomly picked spots to survey out there. Um, we picked something like 20 of them. Um, and uh, one day, uh, you know, the, the students got to survey their own 40 by 40 meter square. They did all the work, and we just yelled at them, you know, walk straighter, walk faster. Uh, and uh, we downloaded these data, and it was like, poof, look, a new earthwork. The students had found a brand new enclosure at the famous Hopo Mound Group. That, that was pretty exciting. Um, what they didn't notice, what we collected data right over here, so it, we didn't get that back in 2001. Giant lightning strike. That thing is uh, like 150 feet long. It's huge. Um, and then these four things here, I don't know if you guys can see them. They're kind of small on the screen. Um, but they're just outside this gateway here. So this was an, another example for me, and uh, a new example for others of, wow, there's more to these earthworks than just the ditches and the embankments that we're so familiar with. Often there's other kinds of architecture just outside the gateways, or in the gateway, or in the middle of the enclosure, or even off in the distance, the gateway's pointing at something. Um, so there's our data from 2001. We stopped just shy of these four things. Uh, I think those four things are pits that were dug in the ground. They're about this big around. 
Uh, and they may have some burned soil in them, and we don't exactly know what's in them yet because Brett has yet to dig them up. So write a letter to your congressman and say, please fund <laughs> Dr. Brett Ruby to go to Hopewell Mound Group and dig up these wakeful features because we're just dying to know what's in them. Um, with the big circle, now hopefully this is big enough for you guys to see, um, we've got the ditch there shows up real nice. Uh, and then every nasty thing possible that's magnetic is cut across this earthwork. This is where the road is today. This is an old fence line. There used to be a railroad down here. This is one of those high voltage power towers down near the bottom, very magnetic. Uh, and yet, through all of that, we can see uh, the ditch very, very clearly. Um, and uh, these gaps here are gateways. So this is how folks 2,000 years ago would come in here for it. Um, we can see when we compare them to the map from Squire and Davis's book from the mid 1800s that hey that looks a little different. Uh, they don't have those gateways on there. So this thing was probably already pretty short by the time Squire and Davis mapped it. They didn't notice those gateways, or they probably would have put them on the map. Um, what they also didn't see was this thing in the middle. I'm not sure you can see that in the back, but if you could, there's four dots that are right in the geometric center of that circle, and they're exactly the same size and shape as the four dots outside of the small circle. So it's a Whatever that is, it's a repeating pattern in Hopewell Mound. Brett, go dig that thing. <laughs> Tell us what it is. Now, I know you probably can't see these, but just inside the ditch there are a number of little dots in the magnetic data. And they look little on that map, but in fact, they're about this big around and about four feet deep. Mm -hmm. And these are what Brett probably talked about during his talk. These are giant holes where very large posts were stuck in the ground bigger than telephone poles, at least in diameter for sure. I'm not sure how tall they were because all we have is the hole they were in, but um, a hole that's four feet deep, theoretically, it can hold up a pretty tall pole. Uh, and they went all the way around this thing. There were over a hundred of them um, that were in the ground there. So at some point in this enclosure's life history, it was a circle of posts, um, and that may be how it started. And we're beginning to find that more and more at these earthwork sites. Uh, that they start as a, a wooden architecture. So that's Hopewell Mound Group. Um, let's jump down to Serpent Mound real quick, um, because I'm sure you guys might want to leave at six to go to eat or whatever. Uh, and stupid traffic in Columbus made the way. Uh, but Serpent Mound is, is fun. Uh, how many people have been to Serpent Mound? All right, everybody. Good. So you're going to see a part of Serpent Mound that you've never seen before. Dash Reeves flew over here in uh, 1934 and took some nice photos for us. Um, what I got involved with was in 2012, we had a project to learn more about Serpent Mound. We wanted to know how was this beast constructed, so we took cores, something like 20 of them, all the way down the spine of the serpent, soil cores. Uh, we wanted to know how old is it, so we were trying to collect charcoal for radiocarbon dating. We got that, we ran seven or eight dates. And then my job was to run the instruments over the serpent and see what I could see. I'd been avoiding going to the serpent um, for a while because it's a two and a half hour drive. Everybody knows the serpent, you know? So it's like, what are you gonna find there? A serpent, you know? Um, we already know it's there, so why bother? There's not much space up there to survey. But I ran the radar down the spine and I surveyed the whole area in there with the magnetometer. And I am glad that I did because we had quite a surprise there. I started at the tail just to see, you know, if it would show up to the magnetometer. And it was real close to the truck, so it was easier to haul it. <laughs> so I could make a mad dash out of there in case, you know, it didn't show up. But um, obviously that's the serpent's tail. And uh, wrong <coughs> old, it is magnetic. Um, so this was day one. Uh, good results. Uh, and I usually download, you know, at the end of the day. This was back in the hotel room. Um, sometimes I'll download in the field so I get a nice surprise. Um, it's kind of like a treasure hunt in a way. Because uh, you, you don't know what you've detected often until you download it. Here was by the end of day three. So the whole, the whole creature is showing up nicely. And we've got some strange linear thing from there that I didn't expect, like that big long thing. That could be a, a CCC era trench that they dug across the serpent that nobody knew about to put in a drainage line. And then they put the dirt back, you know, rebuilt the serpent. Um, yay, thanks CCC um, for that drainage line. Um, there's also this strange linear thing up here. I didn't think much of it as of day three. Didn't know what it was. Uh, and it was kind of covered over by that linear thing, which now I think is a lightning strike, part of a lightning strike. Um, one of the things I was looking for were, was evidence of the trenches that were dug here in the 1800s. 
They did make maps uh, in the 1880s um, when uh, Frederick Ward Putnam was there from the, from the Peabody Museum at Harvard, but he didn't put where his excavation trenches were on his maps. So we don't know exactly where he dug. He talks about more or less where he dug. But, um, you know, we have some possible evidence for trenches. There's a nice gap in the serpent. There's some other weird linear things cutting across the serpent in these areas. It could be trenches from, from the 1800s. But it wasn't until I got up toward the head that things got really interesting. So it was day four where I was like, holy crap, this makes it all worth it. So there it is. Take a look. See if you see anything that doesn't fit the serpent. The serpent seems to have a growth coming off of its neck, doesn't it? <laughs> what is that thing? So when I saw that, I was like, whoa, what the heck is that thing? So. Uh, what I, the first thing I did was like, you know, that shape looks a lot like the shape of these other undulations in the serpent. So I just drew them, those three shapes, one, two, three, and then put them over here, one, two, three, that's their shapes. Drew the, this thing here, and there it is there. And then I overlaid them all right there. And they're all exactly the same shape, and exactly the same size. That thing, whatever it is, that new thing, is a carbon copy of the other undulations of the serpent. It looks like an undulation of the serpent. Wow. Is there a missing coil to the serpent? It sure seems like it. Um, we went back to the photographs that Putnam took when he was there in the 1800s, because he kind of reconstructed the serpent a little bit. Uh, and that coil would be right in here. There's a fence there that's not there today. That's what the lightning hit, I think, that fence. But, um, Here's another view from Putnam. So he's standing on the neck of the serpent. He's looking off to the right, and that new coil would be in here. We, we started calling it the stealth coil because you just can't see it not on the ground. It's invisible. Nobody knew it was there. And Putnam didn't know it was there. And all those guys that made maps of this place over the years, from Squire and Davis on up, they had no idea this thing was there. It doesn't appear on any of the you know, dozen or so maps made of serpent map. Huh, now that's a big find. Um, you're going to change the shape of the, one of the most iconic things you know, in North America. This thing appears in lots of prehistory textbooks. So we decided we needed to get some archaeological evidence of this, and we dug a trench across it. Uh, just a small one, about 3 feet by 15 feet in size. Um, we dug it in little one by one meter squares like good archaeologists. We screened the soil um, as we went. We dug it in levels. Uh, and uh, what we got in the end was about 300 pieces of flint debris from stone tool working. All right, I mean, you can find that everywhere in Ohio. Uh, we had a dozen pieces of rock that had been burned in a fire, firecraft rock. And you find that stuff too everywhere. And we found a fragment of one spear point that probably would have looked like that. That's not ours. Um, there's ours right there. It's hideous. Um, like, very ugly, but it, it, it tells you about how old it is. Um, it dates to this time period here, 3000 to 1000 BC. Huh, that's way older than we think the Serpent Mound probably is. Um, as it turns out, people have been up there on that hill where Serpent Mound is for a long, long time, and they've left a lot of trash behind. Um, and some of that trash has gotten incorporated into the Serpent, because the dirt to build the Serpent comes from that hill. So just by accident, this stuff gets into the Serpent. What we didn't find was no Flint Ridge Flint, really no hopeful artifacts, and no pottery. So, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Um, maybe the serpent is older than we think. So uh, there's a, a view of our trenches, and just a few inches down, we discovered what was causing the magnetic feature. It's this band of light stuff here, and that's where all the artifacts are coming from. It's this powdery white soil that in profile, you can see really nice right there. So that stuff just arcs around in the shape of and what I think it is, is it's where the serpent used to be sitting. And because the serpent was there protecting the old topsoil and the artifacts in it, when they went to scrape up dirt to build the rest of the serpent, they couldn't get under the part they'd already built with. So when they knocked down that stealth coil, they didn't take it all the way down to the clay. They left that little bit of topsoil there accidentally. So the old serpent had protected this serpent-shaped bit of topsoil that had artifacts in it. And um, see, this is what it looks like today. This is that artist friend of mine again. Um, he's kind of easy, Sarja, to <laughs> talk into drawing stuff. He was actually out there helping us dig too, um, some. And uh, that's what we, we have today. And that's maybe what it looked like 
before this coil is erased. What's pretty neat is, um, if you ignore the head, really, um, if you add in this new thing we found, it's a very kind of symmetrical serpent. The tail end has the same kind of shape as this end here with these tighter coils in between. So geometrically, it kind of makes sense, except that head is wacky. So why did they rebuild the serpent? And it could be because this part of the neck here um, it goes down slope pretty good, and it may have just started eroding. Uh, and somebody said, uh, we're going to have to fix that. And the easiest way to fix it is to just put it up on the top of the hill uh, so it doesn't erode off again. Um, that ended up being an important component in our argument about how old the serpent is. Um, remember I said we ran those seven or eight radiocarbon dates? Well, it all came, and we, the, the charcoal we got was from just below the serpent. It was that layer that they built on top of it. And every date was almost the same. They all came back about 300 to 600 BC, um, which told us that, it, and, and we had no dates that were later than that or earlier than that. Um, that told us that maybe the serpent was, is a little bit older than we think, um, because there aren't any later dates underneath the serpent. You'd expect, there, there's a village just down here on the dates to like 1000 AD, um, and there's lots of other stuff up there from before that village. So you'd think if the serpent wasn't there, you'd get some, some dates that are more recent than that. And yet, all of our dates are 300 to 600 BC. So we're thinking that the serpent date is somewhere around about um, 1 AD to 300 BC, somewhere in there, which would put it kind of at that Adena-Hopewell time. You know, kind of before Hopewell, but kind of tail end of Adena. Uh, and you know, this evidence here shows that maybe the serpent was a place that was curated through time. People went back there and fixed it when it eroded. And there have been other radiocarbon dates run on Serpent Mound. Um, they come from one of these coils up in here. I think maybe that one there, or that one. Uh, and this one's also a mirror of a gully that's coming up into the site, an erosional gully. And, um, the dates that have come from there are 1000 AD. So they're you know, quite a bit after our dates, 1, 1,000, 1,300 years. So maybe that's more evidence that the serpent has been managed over the years. And there was a village right over here that dates to that time period, 1,000 AD. So maybe those four ancient folks, um, who incidentally also lived here in the Hawking Valley, um, maybe they were up there and, and they were taking care of the serpent. Um, just like you know, their ancestors did a 1,000 years before. Okay, I think that puts us past six, so I should probably stop. Uh, no, don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> don't say that, man. I can go on for like another hour. I've got a lot more slides. Uh, if anybody has to go, feel free to go. Yeah. Um, I can keep going if you'd like. Yeah, go ahead for do another 15 or so. Okay, um, because this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Sorry, man. Uh, so this is that Fort Ancient site. Uh, this is down towards Cincinnati. The Ohio History Connection owns this place. You can go visit it. Um, great big Hopewell Hilltop enclosure. Three miles of embankments. Um, that some of them are as high as the ceiling here. That's the map that Squire and Davis published. There have been a lot of maps made of this place. Something like 20 different maps over the years. Um, archaeologists started working here in the late 1800s, so it's one of those places that is supposedly well known in Ohio. I love to say that because they've missed this thing for over 100 years. Um, I was hired to go out there in 2005 and do some work um, ahead of uh, a project that the, the Ohio History Connection was doing to fix the embankment walls. They're eroding away because they're right at the top of the slope. And they had a big Save America's Treasures grant you know, to do this work. So to get out to the embankment wall, they were going to have to drive across parts of the site that nobody's ever looked at before. Uh, and they didn't want to damage anything that might be there. So you can see some of the areas are small because they didn't find much. And then this one got big because we kept finding stuff. Uh, and here's what it looked like when Dash Reeves flew over. There's where the embankment is. Uh, and this is where um, we found something really cool. That's the strip I started with. So they were going to drive some heavy equipment across there. Big dump trucks full of boulders and stuff. Uh, and those would definitely damage the ground, uh, possibly, uh, if, if they weren't careful. Uh, 
Um, as far as some other old area photos, we can see that there are some linear things in here. Um, this is where we were interested in. Um, as far as I can figure out, these may be ditches dug by the CCC uh, to drain this part of the site. Terribly wet up there most of the year. Um, it's kind of squishy when you walk across it. So uh, the CCC, I, you know, they did all kinds of stuff up here, including maybe improve the drainage there. <coughs> There's my strip of data. It's just not much bigger than this room is wide, about 20 meters wide. And um, I started from the park road where the machine was going to, where the vehicles were going to start driving. They were going to drive right back here. And you see right in the middle there is that little blob. It's not actually that little. It's, it's 12 or 14 feet across. It's huge. Uh, and this is magnetic data. So when I see that, I think, hmm, that's strange. That shouldn't be there. It's not natural. I immediately thought, I wonder if there was an old cabin site here, and that's a foundation or something I'm seeing. So um, I went and talked to the Ohio History Connection folks. Uh, and I said, you know, I think we should use another instrument out here to see what that is. The magnetometer might not be so good at finding a foundation. But this other thing I have, the resistance meter, it can detect that. So we did the resistance survey. And of course, that found something else. So I said, you know, I think we need to make this survey a little bigger. And I just kept doing that. <coughs> uh, but it was worth it, because in the end, what we got was this. And you can probably see uh, this kind of circular thing there. Uh, and right in the middle of it is, is our big magnetic blob. Um, we also detected some old um, pipes out there that are buried in the ground. Some old steel fence posts out here. Uh, and those linear things from the old aerial photos are in there. They almost look like plow marks. Uh, and then our big circular thing. Let's zoom in on that a little. So this was in 2005, and I was doing a, a number of surveys on ditch and embankment earthworks in Ross County. And I thought, oh, look, Fort Ancient has a little ditch and embankment enclosure. Um, it didn't quite look like them, but it seemed to me that I could see some kind of circular thing. And it almost looked like there were two of them there. Uh, and then down here, it looked a little different. It looked like there was a break in it, and maybe it, there was a gateway or something. And, and that gateway actually looks reminiscent of this one. And this is the Great Circle at Newark. This thing is 1,200 feet across. This thing's only 200 feet across, the thing I found there. Um, so there's a size difference. But shape-wise, they're kind of similar. And then the big thing in the middle, which um, I couldn't resist. Uh, it, that was invisible to the resistance meter, of course. <laughs> uh, and so I figured, well, that's got to probably be something that's burned. So I stuck a soil core in it and pulled it out. And it was almost like the color of this tablecloth here, a little oranger. I mean, it, was, it was burned so hot that the soil turned orangish <coughs> color, red color. You maybe have seen that on, on uh, fireplaces, you know, fire rings you have out, out in your backyard. Um, if you burn Ohio soil, it turns red or orange. Um, so we have this big burned thing in the middle. Uh, there's the resistance data. It doesn't look very exciting, but um, resistance meter did pick up two circular things there. Here's a close-up. Uh, right where the magnetometer did it, it gets this dark area here is soil that just wasn't so good at conducting electricity, so it's more well-drained. I think that soil brought in intentionally uh, to level off this area. Uh, and then um, these two things here, which look like nothing with this color palette, but when we change the color palette, that one in particular really jumps out at you. And this is what I got. The Ohio History Connection archaeologists excited about it. I think those are building structure floors. And that shape there, a square with rounded corners. If you remember way back to our drawing of Mound City with the building underneath the mound, that's the shape, that square with rounded corners. So uh, we were pretty excited about that. Um, there was my interpretive map. It doesn't, doesn't look very exciting, but uh, we've got some kind of enclosure here. Kind of looks like a pumpkin. Uh, these little structure floors, and then our big burn thing in the middle. Um, this was enough to catch the attention of Wright State University archaeologist Bob Reardon. Uh, and he decided to move his, his field school here that he'd been having every year. He'd spent 18 years at this other site. And he decided, oh, I'm going to go to Fort Ancient now. <laughs> and he's been out there ever since 2006, every year. So he's almost up to 10 years of digging out here. The first thing he wanted to figure out was, what is this enclosure here? What's it made of? Is it a ditch and embankment, or is it something else? This is the aftermath of his excavation in 2006. Lots of holes in here. Uh, and what he found was there were two lines of posts, big posts in the ground. Um, this is starting to sound familiar, <laughs> like Hopewell Mound Group. Um, but 
a neat wrinkle on this one is these outer posts here um, were, are actually sitting in trenches that are about this long, about the size of a grave. They're not graves, but um, they're about the size of a grave. And the post is all at one side there, so they dug this trench. They brought the post in, you know, kind of slid it in there and leaned it up against the far end of the trench. And then they packed um, like a couple hundred pounds of rock in the trench behind it to hold that post up. The ground there is so wet that the post would just sort of eventually fall over without the rock in there. Interestingly, that rock doesn't occur naturally. You have to go down to the stream a couple hundred feet below and haul it up um, to fill in these holes. And there are, you know, 100 posts in this circle here, probably. So a lot of work just, just to fill them up with rock, not to mention cutting all those logs, digging all those holes. Um, somebody really wanted to build a post circle. Not only did they build one post circle, but there are two. And in fact, there are three of them. Uh, in trench one here, you've got evidence of two of them. Those are the ones that match up to the magnetic data. Um, the ones in here are just in holes in the ground. They don't have the rock in the trench. In the middle, um, he wanted to check out the, what I thought was a big burn feature. And there it is. He's opened up a, a, an 8 by 8 meter square here. And right in the middle, um, with the magnetometer, I found that big feature uh, is this pit filled with with bright orange dirt. Um, it's hard to see on this photo because we've got a light right above us there, but this dirt is incredibly orange. It's like hunter orange <laughs> in color. And there's nothing in it. It's just orange dirt that's been burned. There's no charcoal, there's no ash. So it's a bit of a mystery as to how they got such a thick amount of burned soil there. But there is a lot of charcoal and ash around this thing, just not in that soil. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Did that have a top on it, a roof, around the surface? Like a built? Oh, the no, not as far as we know. Uh, 200 feet across. Mm -hmm. That said, there are a heck of a lot of posts, other posts inside of it. Um, we really don't know if it was a roof structure. That would be huge. But you know, they built huge earthworks. <laughs> a lot of things they could do. Um, this, it seems, is the floor of a building of some sort. It's not nearly that big. It probably had a roof. Um, so I, I don't know if this one did. Um, but there's another really weird architectural feature in here. Uh, over here in block C, they were looking for the other side of the enclosure. Um, we put some posts in here to mark where the, uh, the post circle should be. And it comes through right in here, and they found the posts in here. But over here, just inside the enclosure, um, they found these strange linear things. They're ditches that were dug into the ground. They're filled with a mixture of kind of sand and gravel, kind of clay. And they, they cut down into the, the clay that's there. But um, what bothered me was, here's Bob's map. And it's probably hard for you guys to see those yellow things. But you don't see anything in my magnetic data out there that looks like that. And I like, huh, something the magnetometer couldn't detect. Darn it. <laughs> uh, but they were trenches, and they did have this gravel in them. And the radar is really good at detecting gravel and clay. So this was right after I got the radar machine. So I thought, well, maybe we'll give it a try and see if we can detect these linear things. Um, you can see from Bob's excavation that they go right up to the edge of his excavation trench. And I figured, well, they must keep going. Let's see if we can see how far they go. So we did two trial blocks. This one didn't have them in it. Uh, and I'm going to show you the results of this one here. So, here it is, and uh, you, you'll note depth here. I'm, I'm going to click the clicker here, and every time we're going to go down a little bit deeper into the ground. So we're slicing the radar data here. And let's see if the uh, linear things, here, here are the linear things. Let's see if they show up. We can already see some right there at about a foot down. This is the floor of that structure over here. There's the burn thing. And it's about at this depth where they really start to pick up. And at this one, um, we can see that, wow, those like match Bob's excavations almost exactly. And they keep on going outside the radar data over here. They don't seem to be up here, though. So, um, wow, I have no idea what these strange ditches are, trenches. And uh, it was at this point where we decided we needed to do more radar survey. So we got a grant from the Ohio Archaeological Council, our professional archaeology organization here. We also have, uh, we celebrate Archaeology Month. So this is kind of appropriate uh, to talk about. Uh, we surveyed the whole thing. Bob brought out some students to help me do the survey. But this is a lot like mowing your yard, so I don't really need too much help pushing the radar back and forth. 
Okay. Here's, the, here's the result. So we're looking at the entire enclosure should be somewhere right here. This is where the burn thing is in the middle. These are Bob's factory piles here. This is where he found the linear features in his trench. So uh, one thing I learned was uh, this massive jump down here, all these little linear things, there's a giant oak tree right there. Those are oak tree roots. <laughs> so if nothing else, I can use the radar to go survey tree roots. Make nice maps of those. I can find utility lines too, by the way, you know, if I ever need something to do. Um, so we were kind of out of luck in this area because, oops, because that tree affected so much space here. Uh, almost all the way up to the burn feature. But, um, where we had found those linear things before was up in here. So let's see uh, if they show up here in black and white. You can begin to see some of the outer posts right there. They're filled with rock. So they show up pretty well. Uh, and sure enough, um, you, can you see those linear things? Mm -hmm. yeah. It almost looks like somebody put their thumbprint right on there. And you're looking at a thumbprint. But you don't see them over here or over here. They're only right in here for some reason. And this is where the burn feature is. And uh, hopefully you see that blob there. That blob of strong radar reflection is right in that gateway that the magnetometer detected. Uh, and when I see stuff like that, especially at Fort Angel, um, I, I tell Bob, you know, that could be a pavement of stone. It's right in the gateway. It'd be something that the Fort Ancient would do, or, or the Hopo would do at Fort Ancient. And sure enough, um, he put his students on it a couple of years ago. It's not, not one pavement, but it's two pavements overlapping that are right there in that gateway. Probably an attempt to keep that area from getting really muddy when they walk in the enclosure. Remember, that area is really wet most of the year. So this is like a giant mud mat, you know, big welcome mat. Welcome to, Bob's calling it the Moorhead Circle. Welcome to the Moorhead Circle. Come on in. You can imagine a neon sign or something. <laughs> uh, they came in there and they burned the heck out of this dirt for some reason. There, there really aren't any human remains inside this thing. So this is something non-mortuary really related. Uh, and uh, it's a huge architectural feature. We don't know if it has a roof on it or not. Um, you kind of think of it as like a giant circus tent. <laughs> In my mind, it is. What those linear things are, we still don't know. But mark my word, the first thing I said was, I wonder if they're drainage features. Yeah. Gravel down into the clay, sounds like a French drain. Mm -hmm. They kind of curve around over to the ravine, but they follow the, uh, kind of they follow the outer enclosure shape. Um, and they're also, you know, right where the big mud mat is too. Maybe they're helping drain an area that just wasn't properly drained. Um, Bob kind of poo-pooed that idea early on. I think he was hoping that something more provocative would emerge. Uh, some of them do have posts in them, these trenches, but, and the radiocarbon dates from charcoal in there, um, put them in the Hopewell era, so they're Hopewell construction, but nothing better is has come out of the excavations he's done there. So it's, it's seeming that he's falling back on the drainage feature kind of thing, which, you know, first so thought is sort of lame. It's not very, so would, not very exciting. They would have had to do the drainage first, wouldn't they? Yeah, maybe so. Well, they might have built the enclosure, discovered that it was not well drained, and they went back and said, well, we've got to improve this. So mm -hmm. maybe they built these drainage features. Maybe they brought in more soil to lift it up a little higher, that that structure floor that I keep talking about there, Bob's been digging that, and it's like this thick. And there are about 10 different levels on that thing. I don't know if they're, and, and the levels include sand and other materials, and I don't know if they're leveling it because it's, it's wet and it's sinking, kind of like Venice, or if it's you know new events that they're doing, and, and before every main event, they just renew the floor. Um, that's one easy way to clean up after yourself, just redo the floor. Um, so the cool thing is that while those trenches aren't sexy, they're a type of architecture that is sort of at a level of, of thinking and, and, and effort that we've never thought of before for the whole world. Not only are they building these earthen enclosures, it's, their shapes probably have cosmological significance. They're burying the dead. But they're also making stone pavements and sort of you know, everyday things like drainage trenches, you know, in my mind, it, like puts them on par with the Romans who were obsessed with drainage and moving water around. Uh, the Hopo were doing that too. And there are a lot of other water features at, at Fort Ancient. There are lots of these little depressions like ponds near the walls that have 
limestone pavements around them too. They may, may have been intentionally creating water features um, at this site. And, and it may be that some of these ditches around the embankments are themselves water features. And there are a number of, of enclosures that we've trenched across the embankment of the ditch. Uh, and in the bottom of the ditch, you know, the, the clay only goes down so deep. And then in a lot of Ohio, you get to gravel, sand and gravel. But the, the ditch goes down in there, and somebody brought the clay back in and lined the bottom of the ditch with clay, and that would hold water. Um, so maybe these ditches weren't just places to get dirt to build embankments, but maybe they were meant to be water features. So your, your enclosure is surrounded by earth and water, and maybe even wood if you have big wooden posts sticking out of there. So, um, of course, you know, this is archaeology. This is the tip of the iceberg, right? All the stuff we don't know has got to be way more interesting and complex than the stuff we do know. Uh, so this geophysics stuff, the reason I call it a geophysics revolution, I mean, it's kind of dramatic, but it's really revolutionizing our thoughts about what we don't know about Ohio Hopewell. It's, it's, there's so much more out there to find. And it's, it's pretty fun. Like every weekend I go out and survey an earthwork, I'm changing the history books a little bit one at a time. It's fun. So any questions? Yeah. Uh, that looks like from where the stones are, would, would they be about two feet deep? And I'm wondering, is that much soil just built up over time? Yeah, they're quite deep, actually. And you're right. It's like a foot and a half down to get to the stone. And um, the soil was probably put there, I would imagine, on purpose by the Hopewell. They buried over this thing. Um, why, we don't know. Uh, when you look at the LIDAR data here, there is a bit of a overall raised area here, not much, but a number of their buildings had these mantles of soil laid on top of them. Um, some of them became mounds, in the mounds, you know, the big mounds, and, and others never got bigger than about this. So it could be that this whole thing had a layer of soil added to it just to cap it off, maybe to keep all of that energy, you know, down in there on the ground. Um, or to, maybe they wanted to start over again, you know, do something else on top of that. So yeah, these are pretty deeply buried. They would settle down in the ground a little bit over 2,000 years as the worms and the ants bring soil up from below. Just like you know, if you live in a house from built in the 1800s, your sidewalk is now a little bit lower than your yard next to it. That's thanks to ants and worms bringing up dirt slowly and depositing it on the surface. And if you don't believe me, go out there after a, a rainstorm and. Uh, especially after a nighttime storm, and collect all of the worm turds you know, at the surface. If you collect those over a year, you get yourself a pretty big pile of those things. Um, so over the millennia, that kind of stuff can really result in things sinking a little bit in the ground. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the perfect circles, and still you said they didn't have the wheel. Yeah. How do you know they didn't have tracks, or how, do you, how are you sure that there weren't any carts? Well, that's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that question. <laughs> the wheel. Mm. Well, still yeah. about the whole world? What do you think about that? Yeah, well, let's, yeah, let's start with the wheel question. Uh, we haven't found any imagery of wheels in the Hopewell stuff, and we haven't found any wheels at all. So unless they're made of only of wood, which could be, um, we don't seem to have any evidence of big carts and stuff like that, um, or anything on wheels. Uh, we do have lots of evidence, though, of baskets. And they're about the size of a five-gallon bucket. And um, most of these mounds were built one basket load at a time. People carry, don't know how far they're carrying. They could be carrying from the wagon over <laughs> to the mound, or from way over there where they got the dirt. And you know that's what kids are for, right? Go move that dirt, would you? Uh, and we think that these places are pilgrimage centers, perhaps, and that people would come to participate in the ceremonies and stuff, but they might also participate in the construction. That might be part of the payments of sorts. You, know, you get to help build Mecca and participate in the ceremonies that occur in Mecca, uh, which has got to be pretty powerful stuff. And they, they may have also brought lots of weird wingdings with them, barracuda jaws and shark's teeth. Micah from Obsidian. Yeah, Obsidian. Or maybe the Hopewell from Ohio are going to these places, getting that stuff and bringing it back. It's, it's hard to tell. Um, the 
as far as we can tell, there's no wheels. Now I'm going to have to look harder to see if I can find some hope while wheels. <laughs> circles are perfect. So how do you make a perfectly circular enclosure? They could use a vine as a string, you know, and walk around. Yeah. yeah, they could just use a rope or a vine or even people holding hands. You can make yourself a nice circle that way. You just have to have a center pole um, as a, a point to start at. But how do you turn that into a perfect square or an octagon? Um, because you can with geometry, but you got to know that stuff. So. Yeah. But there's an octagon mound or earthworks kind of show a lot of high level geometry. Yeah. Not only just in making the shape, but these things are aligned to stuff. Yeah. Like the newer octagon is aligned to the northernmost moonrise on that 18 and a half year cycle. So they have to know the shape, know how to make the shape, and get that shape on the ground. But they can't even see it, right? Because it's so big, they can't see it while they're building it. So there were some serious ar architects and engineers 2,000 years ago in Ohio, and a whole lot of dirt movers <laughs> to help them move all this dirt. We, do, we can see loads of dirt from baskets in the mounds themselves. So you get different colored loads of soil that are coming from different places. And it, it's like little lumps about the volume of a basket. And once in a while, you'll find the basket itself or impressions of it where you know, apparently the basket was shot and you just threw it in there and <coughs> covered it over. What kind of stone is that? Limestone. Limestone. Yeah, yeah there's tons of them. there or where pretty did they get that? That comes from the river, uh, just below. Um, so it, it, it just comes right out of the ground down in Delaware. Uh, there's a lot of it there. It's full of fossils. So you, you wonder what the Hopewell thought about those too. <laughs> um, at Mound City, there is a mound that inside of it. Uh, there, somebody went and found a, 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 a mastodon too. Mm -hmm. Hopewell, somebody, and they buried that in the mound. So mm -hmm. they're kind of they were they just love shiny stuff. They, anything is weird. They would collect it like galena, you know, lead. Um, really weird, heavy stone, kind of shiny. You know, you shouldn't eat it. Bad for you. But we find that in Ohio. It doesn't actually occur here at these earthworks. So. so, what do you think about the Hopewell Road? I mean, do you think there was a road or a path between New York and Chillicothe? So, for those of you who haven't heard about this thing, there's this idea out there, promoted by Dr. Brad Lepper, mm -hmm. that there is a a, a road running from between the octagons, essentially, between Newark and Chillicothe. And uh, he bases that evidence on a couple of things. And the most important thing is this diary, or you know, the journal that these guys in the mid-1800s were keeping um, about their efforts to document the, the earthworks there in Newark. And they talk about one day they were out following these parallel embankment walls. And Newark has lots of long avenues of parallel embankment walls. Some of them are miles long. And they walked out them. And they, they were getting toward the end, and it's raining buckets. Mm -hmm. And they say, and they, they keep going, but we didn't want to get wet, you know, basically. Uh, and that's like the main source of some of the evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, the parts that, that are on the maps that they walked down, you can still see them today in aerial photographs. They're real, they're, and they're miles long. Can the Hopewell do it? Yes, because you know, we've got lots of evidence. Do they exist? <clears throat> It's been so hard to find evidence of these things when you get out away from Newark and away from Chillicothe. So we need more evidence. Mm -hmm. I've looked in the LIDAR, you know, until I'm blue in the face. We haven't been able to find sets of parallel walls in the LIDAR, but that's not surprising because they were never probably more than two or three feet tall. Mm -hmm. And they're made with dirt that's probably just scraped up from right next door. So they're made with dirt that's similar to dirt nearby. So when they melt into the ground and get plowed, they don't show up so well in aerial photographs. So um, they're a trick. I've surveyed over them numerous times in, in various places around Newark, and they just don't show up to my instruments. What I need is to get out in that sort of virgin ground. I, I've surveyed around the airport there in Newark, where they, they cut across the airport. And unfortunately, there's an airport there, so there's all kinds of airport crap in the way that make it hard to see them, you know. Um, someday, uh, maybe we'll find some concrete evidence. Could the Hopewell do it? Yes. Are there lots of parallel walls in Hopewell land that go long distances? Yes, there are. They, they seem to go to streams. 
Mm. So we've got a couple of them in Chillicothe. We have them in Portsmouth. We have them in Marietta. Um, and they're all over. We have them in Newark. Um, but we don't have much evidence yet of them going the distance. They're probably out there. Yeah, in fact. When they, uh, when they go in a straight line, do they follow the terrain up and down, or do they try that's, to level that up? That's the idea, yeah. Oh, well, we don't know. Um, the ones that I'm familiar with, um, like the ones in Portsmouth, there's some on the Kentucky side of Portsmouth, and they, I haven't been down there to walk at all, but they're going across the floodplain, and you know the floodplain is pretty undulating, so those kind of go over Hill and Dale. There's not much evidence to say that they filled in you know, the low spots and level off the high spots. Um, so, from what I've seen, they, they kind of do this, you know, go up and down. And Brad's idea was that they're perfect, they're, they go perfectly straight from Newark to Chillicothe. And I think I'd be more willing to accept that, you know, right away if he didn't say perfectly straight. Because mm -hmm. that adds a level of com huge level of complexity, and they have to go across swamps and streams, and you know, if they just go around some of that stuff, it'd be a lot easier and seemingly more practical, but maybe there was a reason that they went perfectly straight, like they were following a particular angle that was meaningful. Um, but they would definitely have to go up and down stuff in that case. Yeah. Has there been any thought about doing you know, any kind of geophysical surveys for the, the plains, the wolf plains, earthworks? I've thought about it like every year for the past 10 years. My challenge is access. Um, you guys know, like I've surveyed the Hartman, on the Hartman farm at the north end. Mm -hmm. um, this was way back when, it was 10 years ago at least. And uh, there's a nice circle, big circle out there. It showed up, it was subtle. I'd love to go back and resurvey that. So if you guys know anybody yeah. in your family, um, I'd love to go back out there. They'd probably remember me. We were out there in the middle of winter, for, just for one day. And uh, you guys know Elliot Abrams? Yeah. 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 He froze his, took us off, because <laughs> uh, he was helping me. And uh, I'd love to go back there. But there's another area. Um, uh, the, the family, the area starts with a Z. I forget the name of it. Zimmer. What is it? Zimmer. Yeah, I think that's it. Zimmer. Uh, but there's a, there's a hay field there toward the south end of the plains. Um, I hope it's still a hay field. It's not houses yet. But there are at least three enclosures in there, smaller than one, including one of these um, square with rounded corners um, that was mapped by Squire and Davis as a circle. So there's something in there that's way different than what people think we know, you know, what everybody thinks they know. And if I could just get in there, it's eight acres. It wouldn't take me long with that four magnetometer machine. Yeah. Yeah, uh, back to the wheel. Uh, don't you think that technology would be passed on? Uh, you know, in statistics. Yeah, you'd think so. And because, uh, you know, they, they improved on pottery, they improved from that battle to uh, bow and arrow. Yeah, and, and you everything know, else. every other technology was built on, was passed on, and I think if there were, there were a wheel, that would have been a big deal. Yeah, and you know, they didn't have horses around here. Right, and they didn't have ropes, really. I mean, they had paths. Yeah. Trails. So it's possible. Yeah, they did pass on um, knowledge about ceramics, you know, how to make pottery, right. which it, which isn't easy with the materials they had. And they passed on um, weaponry technology, you know, spear points that eventually became arrow points. You know, so eh, thanks for arguing my side. Yeah. <laughs> One more. Um, you mentioned Portsmouth. Uh, there was that rock down mm -hmm. there in Portsmouth that was. Drug out of the river. Stolen by Kentucky and brought back no, no. to Ohio or something. Other way around. Stolen by Ohio. Because oh, the, the river see. is, you know, Kentucky. Yeah. Um, right. And, and is that related to Hopewell, the, the, not, the design on that? Not that I know of, no. Um, there, are a lot of petro there were a lot of petroglyphs in Ohio, and I think a lot of them are a little later in time. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to date uh, carving on a rock. So we, we actually don't know how old a lot of Ohio's petroglyphs are. Sadly, most of them have basically disappeared. Either because people have vandalized them, like uh, you guys probably have heard of Leo Petroglyph. Mm -hmm. That thing is so hard to see today. Um, <coughs> so, yeah. Let's say thank you very much. <laughs>